The Markup is a nonpartisan, nonprofit newsroom that produces meaningful data centered journalism that illuminates how powerful institutions are using technology in ways that impact people and society. Joining me now is co founder and co editor in chief at The Markup, Julia Angwin. You were at ProPublica for a long time. You were diving into this intersection of technology and data anyway. What provoked you to make this a full focus? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I honestly, ProPublica is one of the greatest jobs in journalism, yeah. and it was really hard to leave there. But I have long wanted to build out the kind of work that I do, which is really putting data journalists, who are usually programmers, at the center of investigative work. Um, usually in newsrooms, they're assistants or helpers to an investigative journalist. But what I've learned about investigating technology is that if you put a technologist in charge of the investigation, they understand better what they're trying to find out, and they can use different skills to get there. And so our newsroom is going to be really having half programmers, at least, leading our investigations. And that's something that just doesn't fit into the traditional investigative model. And it's also, by the way, extremely expensive yeah. <laughs> because programmers are so um, in demand. Yeah. Um, so I, I thought it was best to try to start a newsroom totally devoted to that. Now, there's always this gap between, well, maybe it's arbitrary that the programmers aren't very good communicators and the communicators don't understand the science and yeah. the back end very well, right? So how do you how do you get them to start to speak the same language? Yeah, it's challenging, except for the fact that like there are some on both sides who do have those skills, and those are the people we're bringing together. Um, some of the best programmers that um, I'm hiring and that are going to be working with me are, are not traditional. Some of them are self-taught. You know, they came from humanity sometimes and then learned these skills because they needed them. And so it's kind of a non-traditional route. And similarly, I have program, uh, journalists who just taught themselves coding because they wanted to learn some skills that could enhance their reporting. And so as both sides meet, um, I think we're going to build like a new model for what investigative journalism can be if it's really fueled by the best technology. Hmm. You know, I remember your series, and we spoke about it on a different program about algorithmic bias, and that was fantastic. And it was it sort of revealed a lot of things that most people take for granted. So, yep. what kinds of work is that similar to what you're going to be looking at, and not just in the social platforms, but really about technology in general? Yeah, absolutely. So we're going to be looking at a bunch of different ways that technology is impacting society. And it's it really ranges from the very basic, what is it doing to our kids' brains? <laughs> Which is an important question yeah. that we don't know the answer to. What is it doing to the labor market, right? How people's jobs are changing. How is it affecting our privacy or lack thereof? Um, and algorithmic bias, right? The idea that so many decisions about our lives are being made by algorithms and we can't argue with those algorithms, right? They output something and like this is a common thing in hiring, for instance, right? Companies are using software to just scan resumes and look for keywords or whatever. And I don't know if you remember the story, but Amazon yep. admitted that their whole algorithm for hiring just dismissed all women. Right. <laughs> right? In fact, Latoya Peterson was sitting this, in this chair this morning talking about that very same story. Right. Um, is there, do we, are we kind of living in this era where we think, well, if it's tech, it must be good. I mean, there was a series of years there where maybe through the Obama administration where it was just kind of wild west, but it was also just encouraged. Like, oh, go ahead, don't, don't restrict them, don't regulate them, let them flourish, right? Yeah. And in the last year and a half, two years, we've started to have a much more skeptical view on things. But again, that's not the whole population. And is this changing over time, our relationship with what we think of tech? And I also, I should say with the caveat of what we know of it. Yeah. I mean, I think like any new thing when we adopt it, like cars, right? We were just like, oh, let's drive everywhere. And nobody wanted seatbelts. Remember, <laughs> like 50 years, we were like, it's just, you hit something, you die. Like, yeah. that's all, yeah. right? And so whenever we adopt a new technology, we get all excited and like completely over enthusiastic about it. And then there's a moment where we wake up and realize, oh, maybe like, um, coal is raining down from the sky and everyone's getting black lung disease or whatever we realize and we try to mitigate it. I feel like we're at that moment right now with digital technology where we're like, this is awesome. I have a supercomputer in my pocket, but I'm suddenly realizing that like it's affecting my relationships or I don't really know anymore what's true because I get all this weird stuff in my newsfeed and I don't know where these news sources are. And so I think we're just at that moment. It's like a wake up call where everyone's trying to figure it out. I don't think we quite know what the answers are. Like we don't know exactly are we 
like in an irredeemable bad place or are we just in a place where we can just fix around the edges i think mm. like what needs to be done is a little bit more investigation of what the problems are and to really quantify them and that's what we're hoping to do yeah and, and when you look at it's surprising to me that there hasn't been more people studying sort of the impact on screens on children right i mean yeah. I, part of it is is that screens have really only been around in this way yeah. for maybe about 10 years yeah. so you can't do a 50-year study on that but um how how would you assign that story, so to speak, or that beat? I know, it's such a challenge, right? Because what you really need for that is, is longitudinal studies, and that is going to take time. We're only really going to know the way, like, in 20 years, probably. Right. Um, and so what we can That's do... That's a generation of people who yes, would be the guinea pigs. it's a generation, exactly. I mean, think of the generation of women who smoked during their pregnancies, right? Mm -hmm. And everyone was, like, totally fine with that, and then everyone woke up and said, oh, that wasn't a good idea, right? right? Um, so it could be that we end up with that. I think our best effort, I think journalism should always be the ones, like kind of first ones out of the trench, right, over the, and we, so we should be the first ones to point out, it looks bad over here, like here's a story of a, a kid that it didn't work out for, or, mm -hmm. or we could look at the most recent studies and put them together and say like the literature here, or talk about, um, things that are working for some schools or whatever, right? So I think we're never, we're not going to be able to provide the definitive answer sure. on that particular topic. Like, I think on something like hiring software that's biased against women, like, I hope we can provide some definitive answers. But on things like kids, like, I expect us to be more anecdotal and be um, trying to find our way through the mess, mm -hmm. to try to find the truth. And in that case, we will have to rely on science more than our own studies. I don't think we could really credibly do any sort of a study of our own on that topic. You know, the, uh, another thing that uh, uh, Latoya was talking about, actually, about criminal justice reform, the Compass software yep. that was investigated a long time ago. I mean, it seems that on a software level, if you had programmers that could almost reverse engineer something and point out, here's the bias, here's the flaw, here's the point yep. at, at which you failed and you need to rethink your software, yep. because most journalists might point out that the software is bad, I have no idea what the solution is, right? It's, it's, a, right. it's, a, it's a totally different step. Um, and I don't, I don't know how the markup is, you know, if you have the information on what went wrong, yeah. you know, are you almost the first leading agency to say, if it was a seatbelt problem, you take it to the National Transportation Safety Board. If it's a software problem, Bring it to the markup. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, the Compass investigation was our investigation yeah. at ProPublica. And, um, you know, I'm really proud of that work and I because we were... The first ones, everyone had been saying, like, it seems weird that there's software that judges use to mm -hmm. score people on whether they're going to commit a future crime. It sounds like Minority Report, but no one had done a kind of quantified study of it. And so we were the first ones to do that. And so w in cases where we can do that, that is our mission. That is our central goal, right? But there are going to be situations where we won't be able to do that, like on kids, right? But on hiring software, I would hope and expect that yeah. we would, right? On facial recognition software, those kinds of things, we are going to try to do the initial testing. And then what we hope happens, which happened with Compass, is that we put out a data set, we publish our data, and then academics and others can use that to provide more findings and do more explorations about what solutions could look like, right? Yeah. But I think our goal is to diagnose the problem as precisely as possible. Yeah. Is there a, a underlying all of this, in, in, and we sort of take for granted, is the data that we are generating nonstop, yes. right? That is being mined, is being turned into some little uh, in piece of information that an algorithm uses. Yep. Um, and most of us are just sometimes oblivious, sometimes uh, we don't care generationally. I mean, I think yes. the notion of privacy might die with my generation, mm -hmm. um, but maybe autonomy should not. Right? That, right. That, that I should at least have some say in how it's being right. used. Right. Um, and that's a, a, you know, a, a part of the kind of information ecosystem that I hope gets reported on more as well. Yeah, I agree. I think privacy is too small a word for the issues that we face with right. all of this data, and autonomy is a much better word, right? Because what we want is we want... Um, not to have that data used against us, not to have it used to manipulate us, to brainwash us, to make us charge us higher prices than somebody next to us because they know we have that much more in our bank account, right? But we basically want to prevent harms and we want to retain some autonomy over our choices. And so that is the challenge of um, our investigative work is to show when those types of things are happening, right? Because they're always hidden and they're in a black box algorithm somewhere. And so it's gonna take a lot of work to uncover those types of discrimination, but they, I'm sure, will be occurring, and we will hopefully find them. 
All right, Julia Anglin of The Markup, thanks so much for joining Thank us. Thank you.